Needle Fiber is a fair card. No. Today I wanted to talk about some Yu-Gi-Oh hot takes. So I got this idea because a lot of other YouTubers have been doing it. Basically I just asked on social media for you guys' hot, controversial Yu-Gi-Oh opinions and this gives us an opportunity to talk about them. I'll say whether or not I agree, I'll share my opinions on it, and I think it's good because it basically lets us sort of chat and discuss stuff that might not really warrant a full video on its own. So this one might be long, but there's probably gonna be something interesting here, so stick with me. If you like this idea and you enjoy this type of thing, be sure to give the video a like, it lets me know I should keep doing it. All right, now let's dig into the hot takes. Old decks, like from the DM era or so, don't deserve nearly half the support they get in the modern day. Fresh new archetypes and support for newer yet under-supported ones are what keeps the game feeling fresh and it's frustrating to see decks like Dark Magician get handed everything all the time. I agree, but they do this to sell stuff. Ultimately, no one's going to get excited for new crawler support except the small subset of crawler players. But new Blue Eyes support, new Dark Magician support, that turns eyeballs. That's what Yu-Gi-Oh! is known for. People recognize Yugi, they recognize Kaiba, they recognize Dark Magician, they recognize Blue Eyes White Dragon. When that stuff is getting new cards, it's cause for a celebration. Yeah, I mean, short printing aside, I still think that like Magician Souls was going to be a pricey and exclusive card. I think that's what people like. The same goes for heroes. People love heroes. It feels like a classic thing. I'm not a huge hero fan, but I understand why people like it and why Konami would choose to support those types of things more often if they're trying to sell a pack. Particularly if it's a pack that doesn't actually offer like lots of competitive value, you can still just cram the legacy support in there and you still get loads of sales. Limiting special summons in any form does not fix the game, it merely makes combo decks of all power levels bad. I agree. I think that this guy's right. If you limit the amount of special summons people can do, it just means that A, stun decks become a lot more powerful and there are some really annoying ones out there, and then B, I think it sort of hurts any of those decks that aren't overpowered but still need a lot of summons. Let's take Black Wings, for instance. I don't think anybody's going to, you know, argue that Black Wings are like a broken, overpowered deck, but they do need to special summon to make plays happen. So if, you know, take for instance we said, oh, you can only do three special summons per turn, then Black Wings probably won't even be able to set up one of their major synchro monsters. Maybe you can increase that number to five, but then we hit the slippery slope of well, maybe Black Wings are playable with five summons per turn, but what about a Synchron deck? And I'm not talking about like, you know, Jet Synchron, Crystron, Halka Fibrax combos. I'm talking about just a dedicated junk speeder deck that's like a pure sort of Yuse Stardust deck now can't be played. That deck wouldn't have taken over tournaments or been like hugely dominant, but it's just now unplayable. There are simply too many Yu-Gi-Oh decks out there right now that aren't OP but just need their special summons, so I don't think that limiting the amount of special summons in the game really helps with that problem. Pendulums were overblown in terms of how it killed Yu-Gi-Oh. People often say, oh, you can summon five monsters without acknowledging the inherent downsides of pendulums, especially in Master Rule 4. I agree, for the most part. Uh, I definitely think that pendulums, people blame them for, like, you know, ruining Yu-Gi-Oh and stuff, and I don't think that pendulums ruined Yu-Gi-Oh necessarily, but I do think that there are some issues that they brought to the table or exacerbated, and they didn't do a good job of like selling people on them. So first of all, pendulums have two effect text boxes, two colors on the card. They've got these scale icons that no other card has, and then when they were introduced, they added these new separate zones. This is a card that immediately looks unattractive to you know, a lot of existing players or maybe more old school players. I know that pendulums aren't necessarily as complicated as people like to say that they are, but for a new player or just for a more casual novice player, it can look uninviting, it looks confusing. It's kind of the similar argument that people have with like cards have too much effect text. I mean, in fact, you can combine both of these with like that Endymion Mighty Master magic where like the effects are just a novel, there's so much text on it. But then you add in these like icons and all this other stuff and it's like new, these new rules it turns people away from it. I remember we did a video last year where Larry went around and asked people when, like, if they recognized some new Yu-Gi-Oh monsters like Firewall, and a lot of people said that they quit when Konami introduced Pendulum Monsters. And I think that this is a lot of the reason why. It's just, it simply looks like it's too much, it changes the rules, and it didn't help that Pendulum Monsters were kind of a walled garden. You never really saw Pendulum Monsters getting teched into other decks. If you were playing a Pendulum deck, it was a pure Pendulum deck. It just had, you know, like Draco Pals or Perform Pals or Ignites or Cleave Forts, but it was like never like, you know, Blackwing Pendulums, for instance, or like Hero Pendulums. That didn't really come up. So it just felt like if 
you played it, you had to go like all in on it. And if you didn't want to play it, it still sort of intruded because you still needed to understand how that worked because your opponent would use it. So while I do think that like Pendulum's killing Yu-Gi-Oh isn't true, I see why they caused a lot of people to just not want to deal with the increasing level of complication they introduced. Next tape. People only complain about the meta because they can't afford it, but when most of the expensive cards get reprinted, they say it's fair and people need to stop complaining. Uh, sort of agree. I mean, this is definitely something that I've noticed and I have pointed it out before. A lot of people will say a card is broken and unfair and that's mostly because it's expensive, but then like once they get their hands on it, it's sort of suddenly different. Um, I think people's complaints mostly like, this person's right because, yeah, people think stuff's unfair when they can't have a hold of it, but I think that's why they're saying it's unfair. It's mainly because, like, if a powerful card exists, but it's not available to everybody, then not only is the card, like, powerful and polarizing, but the price is also powerful and polarizing. So, you know, maybe the card is just outright unfair. Like, let's take, maybe, say, Lightning Storm. It, it can feel sacky regardless of if it was a common or a secret rare or whatever. But I think that when it's a secret rare and then you can't get a hold of it, losing to it just feels worse because you couldn't have gotten one if you tried. Like you'd have to be lucky and pull it, otherwise you have to pay like a hundred bucks or three hundred bucks for like three of them or something. So I understand where people are coming from. That said, I also think that when cards that are expensive end up getting reprinted, they're seen as more balanced, usually because the game has moved on at that point. So if you take a card like Ash Blossom, for instance, that was like $80 and you needed to have three to compete, but like by the time it got reprinted, you know, maybe the game had moved to a place where more decks could play through Ash Blossom and then like things like Called by the Grave started to come up and that sort of thing. So like Ash Blossom was still very good, but not as polarizing and it's more accessible so like more people are happy. High level players only think in a vacuum. By assuming that everyone is on their level and as invested as they are, they fail to see how degenerate some strategies that they perceive as common have become. Um, agree, I think. So basically, this makes sense to me. I mean, high level players play in like high level environments. So basically, you know, if you're going to a YCS or regional or worlds or whatever, then seeing long combos, seeing unbreakable boards, seeing, you know, like expecting hand traps, expecting strong things like evenly matched and lightning storm, it's all commonplace. So it is possible to just become desensitized to it. That said though, um, I don't think that like top level players necessarily like think that these things are okay. It's more so just that that's the reality they live in. So for them, they have to expect it. It's not that like it's good or bad that the game has loads of special summons or loads of, you know, unbreakable boards or board breaking cards or, you know, whatever. It's just that if that's what you're going to be playing against, there's not really much use in complaining about it. You just sort of like suck it up and deal. I agree though that, you know, these things can seem really like overbearing to somebody who isn't playing in that environment, but I don't think that's the fault of the competitive players. People complaining about modern competitive play are the ones who are out of touch with the game. Numbers don't lie, and it's the fact that turning numbers, pre-COVID, are better than ever regardless of complaints about summoning half your deck or unbreakable turn one boards. Uh, yes and no. So if you have a complaint about like modern Yu-Gi-Oh, and I've got plenty, I don't think that that means you're like out of touch with the game. It just depends, like different people express it differently. So there are a set of people who hate everything about modern Yu-Gi-Oh. They've hated it since Synchros. Like Synchros ruined this game, they're too new. Xyz ruined this game, they're too new, and like so on and so forth. I think if you're the type of person who just sort of complains about new Yu-Gi-Oh because it's, it's just too complicated and I don't like it and they ruined it, I don't feel like that's really enough of a an opinion to have like I mean I feel like that you have to like really justify it and support it I see why you don't like it but like if it's just sort of mindless rambling into the void that doesn't do anything but you know if you don't like the game but you have valid reasons and like you back them up and you have solutions that you're offering I don't think that means you're out of touch like for instance I feel like the game has lots of problems but I do think that there are problems that could be solved, either with like alternate formats or, you know, maybe some changes to how products are created. I don't think that makes a person out of touch. I just think that, you know, 
it, it's their opinion. I don't know. This one's this one's hard. As for the tournament numbers thing, that's a bit of a tricky one too. So yes, tournaments have been growing a lot in the last few years. We've been breaking more and more records at these YCS events, and that's good. But I don't think that necessarily speaks the whole story. Like at the sort of local level, I have heard a lot more people talk about how like their local communities have you know, ended, like just have died off, like there aren't tournaments at their local card shops, not enough people show up to Yu-Gi-Oh! or that Yu-Gi-Oh! is still difficult to introduce to people. A lot of the people playing in tournaments are still people who, you know, might be like in their 20s or something and so they've had a lot of time to be exposed to Yu-Gi-Oh! and maybe it's easier for them to pick up the game and understand it, but I still feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! is not necessarily pulling lots of like kids and teens and that's partly because it's a hard game to introduce to people. So yes, while like big tournaments are getting bigger and that's good, it doesn't mean that there aren't problems with the game, especially its accessibility. Next take. No matter what some people try to convince themselves, Link Summoning was never intended to slow the game down, it just so happened to at the start of its era. By pure coincidence, casual elitists need to get over themselves on this argument. Hard agree. This is actually something that I've said for a long, long time. So people have this thing where they're like, Links were supposed to slow Yu-Gi-Oh down and Konami failed, like they didn't do that at all, this was a complete lie. But that was never actually said anywhere. Like if someone can find me the official statement by Konami or anywhere else that said like Link monsters were designed to slow Yu-Gi-Oh down or balance Yu-Gi-Oh, you won't find it. They've never said this. This has never been put into writing as far as I'm concerned. I think that's something that sort of was perpetuated by the players, people just talking on Facebook and Reddit and stuff, people's knee-jerk reactions to Link monsters and the whole extra monster zones and all that stuff with Master of Four. I think people assumed, well, yeah, it looks like this is supposed to limit extra deck summons, but the rhetoric of slow the game down, I don't agree because that isn't something that actually was ever said. Konami should limit all the major hand traps. Evenly matches, impermanence, lightning storm, etc. to one each. Disagree. So my thing with that is I get that these cards are pretty OP. They can be really polarizing. They can be really overwhelming. I've actually spoken at length about why I don't think that stuff like hand traps and like, you know, evenly matched and stuff are very beginner friendly. But I don't think that limiting them solves the problem because these cards are fine at the competitive level. If you're playing in a regional, you're playing in a YCS, you expect to see all this stuff, you prepare for it accordingly. My problem with these cards is that at the casual level or at the beginner level, they can make the game seem uninviting. Like, you know, you finally set up your board with your really underwhelming deck and then it gets evenly matched. Or you're playing a deck that's really inconsistent and then like your one search card gets Ash Blossom and you just have to end your turn there and end up losing. I think though that limiting the cards would just make the tournament scene get out of whack. So what I feel the better solution is, is to just create some type of alternative format for people. Let the competitive players play with their powerful cards. They're designed to be checks on that type of stuff. It's just that I don't think that new players need to be exposed to that, or casual players don't want to deal with that style of Yu-Gi-Oh. There should be an alternative for them. Not including artists' names on cards is a business practice that hurts both players and the artists in the long run. Yeah, this is something that's always kind of driven me crazy with Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh does not give any credit to its artists. So other card games do this. I know for one, Pokemon definitely does. A lot of Pokemon cards have vastly different artworks that are just depicted in totally different styles and they'll usually give credit to the artist at the bottom of the card. Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't do any of that and I don't really understand why. I mean, I think a lot of it is just Konami being this older, really traditionally run style business where like NDAs are tight. That's what I've heard online at least. I know that, you know, artists aren't, not only do they not get credit on the cards, but I think artists also aren't allowed to talk about their involvement with like Yu-Gi-Oh really. I mean, they can't take credit for it. I know for instance, Ginzelman, who was the artist who designed Cosmos and he actually does the art for a lot of the TCG exclusive archetypes. You could seek him out or like hear the rumors on the internet, but he isn't allowed to just outright say, I designed the Yu-Gi-Oh Cosmo archetype and I'm really proud of it. I think that their NDAs just prevent him from saying that. Maybe the reason they do it is so that like, it might be like a, a counterfeit type of thing. Like maybe Konami's afraid that players will, would go to him and then like have him draw, you know, Cosmo farm girl doing some horrible thing and then like it might reflect badly on Yu-Gi-Oh. 
I don't really know, but I think it's something that needs to change. YouTubers ruin the secondary market. A card shouldn't spike in price because this one person said it may be good. Uh, I actually disagree. So yes, YouTubers make these videos where you know they're, they'll hype up a card or a deck and people buy it and there's like buyouts and stuff, but that isn't really the Yugi tubers. I think that's just the players. If people choose to, you know, be excited by something and buy it, that's more on them than on the creator. Um, I mean, like, I see where the problem is. I get where the take is coming from. I just don't actually think that Yu-Gi-Oh! players are thinking when they buy these cards. If you think a card's good, you probably have bought it anyway. Maybe the megaphone effect, like, accelerates it a bit, but I still think that it's on people to responsibly consider whether or not they want to buy something, and that's sort of... I mean, I think that's all there really is to say about it. Next take. I miss the older Yu-Gi-Oh games, where you can be your own character and stuff. Also, being forced to use the new summoning rules and Matsu's own stuff kind of takes me out of playing them. Yeah, I agree with this. Uh, I think that the older Yu-Gi-Oh games just felt like kind of more like video games. I feel like nowadays they're just trying to sort of slap a simulator onto things. Legacy of the Duelist is a great game if you like just playing Yu-Gi-Oh, but I enjoy the idea of like Yu-Gi-Oh as maybe more of like an RPG or like an open world game. You go around Battle City and like you challenge people and take their rarest cards and improve your deck and like you the character kind of have a, a place in the story like you're this unknown duelist who you know comes onto the scene and ends up you know in eventually taking the tournament by storm and you even beat Yami Yugi in the finals. I like more story and more like sort of player driven interaction not just sort of like you're playing the game. And yeah, I think it actually could be cooler to not have to follow some of these new master rules. It'd be neat to just sort of see like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes and Ace Monsters just be easier to summon and like be animated and it's more about basic strategy and stuff and having fun just because like a simulator is a simulator but a video game is a video game if that makes any sense. Okay so this one's from MBT Yu-Gi-Oh who I just want to say this now has some of the best takes on Yu-Gi-Oh Twitter. You definitely need to be following him and his YouTube channel. Almost every problem keeping Yu-Gi-Oh less popular than Magic the Gathering would be resolved with a rotating format, plus a non-rotating legacy or expanded format of course. Definitely agreed. Uh, this is one that I actually have thought about for quite a long time because I really do feel like new player experience is a big problem in this game. Like even more so than power creep, even more so than card prices or even like deck imbalance is just the simple fact that new people can get very overwhelmed with this game. Just the powerful cards, the complicated rules, it can be tough for someone's first exposure to this game to feel positive and like encouraging if they get evenly matched, ash blossomed, the works. If a card is overbearing and like people are, aren't enjoying playing against it, you can always know that it will just be rotated out. There's not this matter of like, well, will they ban it? Will they limit it? Will they nerf this deck? You just know that the deck will be rotated out. I think this could also help with card prices because you know, you know that cards in the competitive sphere would be rotated in and out. I don't think card prices could ever get so high because like you wouldn't be willing to invest in them and I think that that would be a good thing. And just having alternative formats, like where there's a legacy format for people who want to just play with everything, but then there's also like formats that rotate so that powerful cards can get moved out of the picture and new stuff can come in, means that like casuals have something, competitors have something. If you're somewhere in the in between, you could have like a different type of format you want to play. I think it would solve a lot of stuff, and I just I definitely agree with it. When discussing cards that can come off the ban list, you need to consider the future of the game, not the past or the present. Don't tell me that X card is at two or three in the OCG and isn't doing anything, so the TCG should follow, while also arguing that sim limits don't do anything, and so on. Yes, agree for sure. So this is something that I've felt for a while now. People like to sort of say like, well, the OCG has three copies of this, and it's fine. Or, well, in the OCG this deck didn't do anything, so it won't do anything here. That doesn't check out for me. I think that the TCG and the OCG are two different games. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I mean, I'd love it if they were the same game and played by the same rules, but they're not. So within the reality in which we exist, they are different things. And that means that certain cards coming out and certain cards not coming out, it, it all, like, you know, you can't compare that apples to apples. Um, with ban lists, I've 
it's mixed, you know, there are some cards that I think could come off the ban list and not really make a dent. There are some cards that I want off the ban list, but I also know that if they came off, it just it wouldn't be okay. Um, the thing is, it's, I agree the most with this take, which is the whole comparison part. Like, people, I think, are so excited about the idea of maybe getting Maxi back or getting all the Dragon Rollers back at 3 or something that they don't look at how really restricted the design space in Yu-Gi-Oh! is right now. Stun cards and decks are good for the game. You may not enjoy playing against these things. Not only can these cards help keep the ever-insane meta in check, but they're easy to play, usually have a low price tag, and I believe accessibility is key for this ever-growing game. I agree. Yeah, I mean, stun decks are fine. Like, they're annoying. I think that lots of people don't enjoy facing them. That's fine. I don't love facing Altergeist or Eldritch or Paleo or any of that stuff. It's not, you know, what I look forward to, but I don't hate it. I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! honestly, like, traditionally has been a game where there's usually one major, like, powerful combo deck, and then one major control deck. Like, if you look at sort of just past years, that typically has been the case. I think it's just one of those, like, you know, there can't be yin without yang, it's really fine, you have to respect both. If you don't like playing against floodgates and stuff, then you have to main deck your twin twisters and your cosmic cyclones or whatever. It's that's just kind of how it is. Next take. Speed duels would have been better if Konami made different artworks for the different characters' ace monsters and added a new rarity you can only get from speed duel packs. Agreed. I like speed duels. I've said this for a long time. I find it very enjoyable. They're simple to jump into. They don't take a long time. It's fun, but Konami completely dropped the ball with marketing and just like supporting it. They don't get much fanfare. You, you can't really play it at locals because there's not really much like local OTS support for speed duels. And most people feel like they're just worse duel links or that you're being sold the same old cars from like 2005 just in a new package. Why should I pay $10 for a speed duel Sphere Karibo for instance? And these are all valid concerns. I like speed duels but I'm not dumb enough to try to argue that these problems don't exist. I think at this point there's just not loads of hope for it. And I, you know, I what this guy's saying is right. If they maybe would have had like some cool speed duel exclusive rarity, like with a special border or a special effect, and they made certain cards like only obtainable in that rarity, then maybe people would be incentivized to try speed duels out. Or of course you can just sell it in different artwork and rarity or something of Dark Magician Girl and the Sims will come swooning. Hand traps go against the core design of Yu-Gi-Oh! And hand traps lead to this paranoia mindset of not trusting your opponent and assuming that they run them. Yeah, I agree. Um, my opinions on hand traps have kind of changed throughout the years. There's a period of time where I hated them, there's a period of time where I think they're fine. I've just settled somewhere in between with saying they're a necessary evil given the way that the rest of Yu-Gi-Oh! has developed, but I still don't personally like that they kind of kicked traps out of the picture. I mean, they, they've taken over so much of the role that like traps used to play that there's just so little reason to run them. And that's crazy to me because I remember when cars like Solemn Judgment were these, you know, just cornerstones of like Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, you know, the idea of Solemn Judgment being this you know, omni-negating card that it, you have to respect it and if you can bait it then you're, you know, all that type of thing. And, but now it's just like, Ashes in hand, right? Valor. They're, they're much less fair in that way. I would, I liked the age of Yu-Gi-Oh where like you had to really fear what back row was, but you still knew that it was back row. If your opponent had cards set, you knew to like tiptoe around them, try to bait them, try to use whatever knowledge you could of their deck to guess what the cards might be. And you could even destroy them preemptively with your MST. Also, real quick, just want to talk about the fact that I hate that traps have now had to just become activatable from the hand in order to sort of keep up, but it just, with hand traps, it's like it feels like so much more of a guessing game. Do they have it? Do they not? Well, who knows? Do I have the out or do I not? Well, who knows? I don't like that. It, that's, that's, I definitely, yes. Good take. The Yu-Gi-Oh! anime is a good stepping stone for those who want to get into the TCG. I agree if you're talking about something like Brains or even like Arc 5. Those actually did a really good job, I think, of showcasing real-life decks. So basically, if you've watched Yu-Gi-Oh! Range, you'll actually know that all the protagonists and stuff, they use Soul Burner uses Salamangrates, um, Revolver uses Rockets, Blue Maiden uses Marincess, and like, you know, Yusaku uses Code Talkers, and they actually are pretty accurate to how they work in the real game, even the combos that they make and the effects the monsters use. So there's less kind of just BS factor, making up cards as you go, making up rules. 
Though that does not apply to a lot of the original anime, uh, Duel Monsters, as great of an anime as it is, and as much as I love it, is a complete mess and you definitely should not watch it to learn anything about Yu-Gi-Oh. So it, it really just depends. This person says the anime should be realistic and instead of showing people saving the world, it should just show people buying cards or editing their decks. 100% agree. Great take. I have said this before and I, I still think it's true. I would love to see a Yu-Gi-Oh! anime that's kind of akin to, let's say, the Vanguard anime initially, where basically it's a bunch of kids in like maybe an after-school club or like a, a dueling club, and they go to their local card shop and they buy packs and they edit their decks and they prepare for big tournaments at their card shop or against the other card shop. I think this would be good because it would show Yu-Gi-Oh! in a more realistic light. Now I get it, anime needs to kind of have theatrics and fate of the world and all that stuff to be exciting, but I don't know, I don't think that Yu-Gi-Oh! does that very well. It's done it well in the past, like I think the Duel Monsters and GX were fine like for having these kind of crazy world-ending plots and wild villains, but I don't know, I just, I think that it would resonate more with people playing the game if it just looked like the people on TV were playing the game. And you could add like elements of drama to it. I think of animes like, you know, Shokugeki no Soma or one that I actually recently liked, Smile Down the Runway, that show real life things and just add drama and like intensity to them, but they're still real life things. No one's doing something that's like unbelievable. So yeah, I agree with this take. Konami North America's reason for banning cards is solely for pushing new sets and for profit while the OCG toys around with the semi-limits to push for a healthier format. I mean, I'm mixed on this, like kind of agree, kind of don't. I do think that in North America, ban lists are meant to sort of like influence how products sell, funneling people to buy new packs and get new cards and kind of let go of older decks. Is it like with malicious intent? I don't. No, that's malicious. I mean, they're a business. That's what they're supposed to do. I don't know the intention of like, how the OCG does things, and I'm not sure if they're trying to push product or if they're trying to balance the game. So I don't want to assume what each of these companies mean by the decisions they make, but I will agree with you that I think the OCG does a better job of experimenting with like how to balance a format. I'm not saying they do a great job of it or that they're like, that their formats are much, much better. I don't know. I don't play it. But I do think that I like seeing the idea of maybe semi-limiting cards or, you know, limiting cards creatively so that you can sort of fine-tune the power level of a certain deck instead of just like, oh, well, you know, this year's decks, we're tired, we've sold enough of it, they all just get hit at the same time and they just go and they're not relevant anymore and now you need to buy the new stuff. I think that the TCG can be a bit more heavy-handed in that way. But the OCG has its problems too. Like in the OCG, when I look at those ban lists, I do sometimes feel like they will like nickel and dime decks so hard that it can feel confusing even. Like if your deck has three or four different cards all getting hit to one or two, it just makes deck building a lot more complicated compared to maybe in a TCG where they'll just ban like the one card but leave most of the rest of the deck alone. I, I think that like, I don't know, it's it kind of balances out. So I sort of agree with this point in that like the OCG is more creative and I like that, but I don't want to assume too much or say that one's better than the other. Konami should never add a new summoning mechanic, there's way too many already. I agree. I, I, I'm done with new summoning mechanics, I really don't think we need another one. I get that it's fun and exciting and we need like a red bordered card, but no. I, this game's too confusing as it is. We have, I think, exhausted every possible way that you can summon a monster at this point. I mean, unless you just straight up summon the things straight from the deck somehow or whatever, like, I don't know. I don't think that we need anything like that. The extra deck is already too cramped. There's like a billion different types of monsters in there already. We we have our own sort of set of main deck things. We've got contact fusing. It just, I, I don't think that we need another set of rules to have to explain to people. This game is too complicated as it is. Mystic Mind is a perfectly healthy card that helps underperforming decks. Banning it stops weaker decks from having a fighting chance. And a similar one that I'm going to go ahead and include in here, someone says Mystic Mind isn't overpowered, people just refuse to play out in their deck because they'd rather try and bomb out a huge board that gets made useless by one huge field spell. Um, I sort of kind of agree. I don't like Mystic Mind that much as a card because I feel like it can sort of like put the duel on halt. 
and that's not fun and I've like, seen it just draw things out into like literally an overtime draw and that doesn't feel fun for people. But I agree that Mystic Mind is the type of card that more people should respect it rather than just hating it. Because yeah, I think people should, you know, play Cosmic Cyclone, play Twin Twisters, main deck your outs, but that dilutes combo decks and people don't want to dilute their combos, but I would love if Yu-Gi-Oh could have more space for staple cards in general, just staple removal things and not simply, you know, combo, combo, combos. Because, you know, Raigeki is legal. It's an extremely powerful card. It's not played. It's not even side deck. People don't want to play it because it doesn't advance like a combo, but I, and the same thing goes for like Cosmic Cycle and Twin Twisters, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you here. I mean, I think that Mystic Mine should force people to do that. Do I think the card itself is fun to play against? No, when it shows up and ruins games, it is not fun. But I see where you're coming from, so sure, I, I, I get you. The rate at which Konami introduces new stuff is exhausting. As someone who's only casual, there's some new hotness or thing to look out for every month, and the money and time to keep up is exhausting. Yeah, I, I can agree with this, actually. I think that Konami should slow down the rate of new product releases sometimes. It's not that I don't want new stuff, it's that I do sometimes think that the game moves so fast where, like, if you don't build a deck within a week or two of it releasing, it can just end up feeling like it's not worth building it anymore because the next big thing is right around the corner. And I do feel like this is sort of exacerbated by the whole leak culture, where now we know a lot about new cards before they release, sometimes months in advance or even like a year in advance. And so it's hard to like be satisfied with a deck. It's tough to want to build a deck because you know that it's going to be getting more support later and that's when it likes to be playable so you don't finish it. But then like by the time you finish it, there's new decks around the corner. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think that maybe seeing slightly smaller sets, or even fewer sets per year, like instead of four main series sets, we could cut it down to three. Or maybe cut the number of cards in sets. And that might even help us get rid of some of like the fluff sort of pack filler. I don't know. I mean, I know like people might be mad at me because like they just like getting new archetypes, but like every two or three weeks there's like a new product releasing and it just sometimes feels like it's so fast that you can't appreciate these decks. And some decks might even just get time in the competitive spotlight if it wasn't for being outclassed or immediately overshadowed by something new. All right, and that concludes my takes on your Yu-Gi-Oh! Hot Takes. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you did enjoy it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Let me know if you want to do more of this type of content and subscribe to Team APS so you don't miss it. These new Yu-Gi-Oh! Attribute shirts though, these are available on the Team APS Teespring. We've got one in each of the six main attributes. So if you want to grab one, go ahead and head over there. The link's in the description. Anyways, leave your other Yu-Gi-Oh! Hot Takes controversial opinions down in the comments. All right, that's going to be it. I will see you guys in the next one. Past turn. This video is sponsored by Ridge Wallets. If you're like me, you've probably been carrying around a traditional bulky wallet for a lot of your life. They're, they're just big, they're cumbersome, they make that awkward bulge in your pants. Ridge Wallets are not like that at all. It's slim, it's minimalist, it's modern. If you do carry cash around in 2020, like I sometimes do, and you probably do, you're a Yu-Gi-Oh player, then you've got a clip for it right here, but you can also just keep your cards like this. Press this, cards come out, and also, it's RFID protected, which means that there's no pesky scanning your card through your wallet, and it comes in three different designs. There's carbon fiber, there's titanium, and there's aluminum. So Ridge wallets are great to buy for yourself, but also you could even buy them for a family member. For instance, Father's Day is coming up soon, and this would make a really great gift. If you want to get a Ridge wallet, you can check out ridge.com APS. You'll get a discount. The link is down below in the description. So thanks again to Ridge Wallets for sponsoring today's video.